It is 1 a.m. in Washington, 7 in Berlin, and 2 on a Thursday afternoon here in Seoul. I'm Moon Gunyoung. These are what's making headlines at this hour. It's been 15 days since the nation's tragic ferry accident, and the nation continues its search for the nearly 90 people who are still missing and for answers to the many questions that have emerged since. Japan cannot follow in the footsteps of Germany in atoning for its wartime atrocities, says Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Now this in an interview with the German Daily. And the U.S. Fed keeps its monetary policy course unchanged, saying the world's largest economy is picking up after a wind chill. And we begin this Thursday afternoon with the latest on the Seolho ferry disaster. Strong currents and bad weather hampered search efforts overnight, but conditions have improved since. The confirmed death toll now stands at 213, with 89 people, mostly teenagers, still unaccounted for. For the latest on the search operations and the ongoing investigation into the sinking, our Shin Semin joins us from the news center. Now, Semin, what are we learning of late? Yes, Kanyang, into now a 16th day since the ferry capsized, the families of the victims continue to wait for the news of their loved ones. And as you just mentioned, the current death toll stands at 213 after another body was discovered early this morning at around 4 a.m. The more favorable weather conditions are, um, near the accident site aren't doing much good as high tides and fast currents are hampering the search operations. Now, rescuers are not only focusing on the fourth floor where most of the missing were initially thought to be, but also on the fifth floor lobby where many of the recently retrieved bodies were located. So far of the ferry's 111 cabins, 44 have been checked by divers. And one female student victim who was recovered Wednesday was initially found by a fisherman who was out to prevent the ferry's oil spill from spreading to his fish farm. The victim was found approximately 2.4 kilometers away from the accident site, making families worry that some victims victims' bodies may have drifted out to sea. Now, the sense of urgency in finding victims has never wavered. The, co the Coast Guard once again tried to deploy a diving bell this morning, but failed. A diving bell is a chamber that can be used as a base for divers, enabling them to stay underwater for about an, for about an hour without having to return to the space. Now, today's failed attempt follows another on, on Wednesday where officials were forced to scrap the plans after just 20 minutes uh, when an air supply hose broke. Now, Semin, uh, in another development, the Korea Coast Guard has issued an apology to the victims' families. Now, what prompted this uh, two whole weeks after the accident especially? Yes, there was a press briefing in Chindo Wednesday where the Commissioner General of the Korea Coast Guard, Kim seok yoon a member of the government task force handling the disaster, apologized for the pain the accident has caused the families. He bowed his head and assumed responsibility for the disorganized, inefficient, and slow rescue efforts. He also said he'd push for clear answers in the criminal investigations. We truly apologize for victims of the family who are going through an unbearable sorrow and agony. We accept that initial operation efforts weren't fast and efficient enough. All members of the Korea Coast Guard will fully cooperate with the investigation. That includes allegations against the operator of the ferry Chunghejin Marine Company of overloading the vessel. Now, two staff members have been arrested for ignoring crew member safety warnings on multiple occasions. And also, a shocking revelation was made regarding rescue operations in the early days following the ferry sinking. A lawmaker of the Parliamentary Defense Committee said that a report by the Defense Ministry showed the Maritime Police restricted the Navy from getting close to the accident site and claimed that Undine, a private rescue operation company, should die first, the company that was hired by Changhejin Marine. 
Right, so it seems like there is much uh, to be investigated on that front as well. Now, Simon, what about the investigation into the owner of the Cheongyajin Marine Company? Now, what do we know now? Yes, Kanyang, a special investigation team is speeding up its probe, especially on the practical owner of the ferry operator, Yu Bengun. Yu's brother in law and two daughters have been notified to appear both before prosecutors by Friday, 10 a.m. Korea time, so they now only have less than 24 hours to meet the deadline. And one of seven key figures linked to Yu is Song Guk Bin, the CEO of the co cosmetic company called Tapanda. A song was uh, questioned for 14 hours Wednesday at the Incheon District Prosecutor's Office on suspicion of corruption. He is the second person to be questioned as a suspect following Kim An Shik, the president of the Changhejin Marine Company, for any involvement. Involvement in business irregularities such as embezzlement, dereliction of duty, and tax evasion in connection with you. Also, investigations have revealed that the Sewolho ferry had been put up for sale one month, just one month before the accident. And if the company would have sold it at its uh, asking price, the Changhejin Marine Company would have taken a loss of roughly $5.8 million. Investigators are trying to figure out why. And now that's all I have for now, but we will bring you more updates uh, uh, in the later on. And in the wake of the fair disaster, the government will put more money into establishing an integrated disaster response system and boosting emergency training. At a financial strategy meeting Thursday, President Park Geun-hye asked all ministries to make sure manuals that contain emergency response procedures are in place and those in charge are well informed and properly trained. While recognizing the need to spend more on welfare, the president also talked about maintaining the country's financial soundness through a so-called pay-go policy whereby expenditures are paid for with funds that are already available. Now, overall spending would be further reduced by merging some 600 projects that overlap or are in similar in nature over the next three years. Meanwhile, the unbearable wait continues on Chindo Island for dozens of families. They refuse to leave the area until their loved ones, who are still missing, return to them. Volunteer workers have been doing all they can, but now a group of people who have gone through a similar experience are on site to offer some support. Our Kwon Soa has their story. A group who knows as well as anyone the pain of having lost a family member in a ship disaster arrived on Tindu Island Wednesday afternoon to help the people who continue to wait for word of their loved ones who were aboard the Sewalhu ferry. The new group of volunteers is made up of family members of the victims who lost their lives when the South Korean warship Cheonan sunk on March 26, 2010. 46 people tragically lost their lives that day. Around 30 of their family members went to Jindu to stay with the families at Pengmukang Harbor and Jindu Indoor Auditorium. The people there waiting for word on the missing have been there for more than two weeks now and don't have much physical or mental strength left. The family members of the Tonan victims said they want to pay back the help they received from other volunteers four years ago. They added that they are being careful not to draw attention to themselves, that they just want to provide help in any way they can. That includes doing the laundry, cleaning up and serving food, among other tasks. They have also expressed their sorrow and frustration about this Heolho tragedy. I would have never thought that so many young students would die. And at this moment, I'm just sad. Why do these tragic incidents keep occurring? I hope this kind of tragedy never happens again. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. All of the day's important events, events close to home and around the world. Join Moon Gon Yong, live from Seoul. Oh, ball shopping market for the dual use of the Korean name East and Japanese name C of Japan in school textbooks in the state of Virginia. The U.S. Federal Reserve on Wednesday continued to wind down its bond buying stimulus program while maintaining its rosy outlook on the economy. Now, it left its interest rate unchanged, pinned at near zero. Arirang News Hwang Ji-hye has the details. 
There were no big surprises after a two day meeting of the U.S. Federal Reserve Policymaking Committee on Wednesday. The Fed said that it will scale back its bond buying stimulus measures by another 10 billion U.S. dollars to 45 billion a month starting in May. That is on track with the Fed's earlier plan to end the program as early as October. The central bank pointed to a pickup in growth, saying the economic slowdown in the first quarter was due to the harsh winter weather. Earlier in the day, a separate report showed that the U.S. economy grew just 0.1 percent in the first three months of this year. People are looking forward, and the Fed is also looking forward. Some of the more recent data on auto sales and the uh, today's Chicago uh, Purchasing Managers uh, survey suggests that we're getting some strength, we're getting some recovery from that really tough cold winter. The Fed, however, did not provide any new insight into when it will start raising its near zero interest rates, which have held steady since December 2008. The bank reiterated that it will keep the rate unchanged for a considerable amount of time after the bond purchases end. The Fed began cutting back its $85 billion monthly bond buying stimulus in December as it cautioned about potential bubbles in assets while labor markets improved. Huang Jie, Arirang News. April was another solid month for Korean exports. The nation's trade balance has now been in the black for 27 months. The trade ministry said Thursday that outbound shipments in April came to 50.3 billion U.S. dollars, up 9 percent on year. Now, this also marks the second time the country's exports have surpassed 50 billion dollar mark since October of last year. The nation's trade surplus stood at around $4.5 billion last month as imports came to $45.9 billion, up 5 percent from the same period last year. Meanwhile, Korea's consumer prices grew at the fastest pace in eight months in April, easing concerns about deflation. The nation's consumer price index rose 1.5 percent from a year earlier, which is the fastest on-year rise since August last year. The price of fresh food like agricultural and fisheries products dropped by rising utility costs like electricity, water and gas, as well as home rental prices attributed to the spike. The data comes amid worries the country might be entering a deflation phase as the consumer price growth has been stuck around 1 percent since last September. Now, shifting our focus to domestic politics, with a little over one month remaining before the June 4th local elections, the nation's political parties are busy finalizing their list of men and women they want to put forward as candidates. While many races remain up in the air, some have already taken shape. Our Chimangil reports. The ruling Senuri Party and the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy have begun pinning down their mayoral and provincial governor candidates in the race toward the June 4th local elections. A number of races crystallized on Wednesday. In Busan, the nation's second largest city, the ruling Senuri Party's candidate is Ha Byung Soo. He'll face off against Kim Young Chun of the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy and independent Oh Ga Don. I saw Byung Su will work to solve the unemployment problem and open up a future that guarantees a bountiful life for the citizens of Busan. In Korea's fifth largest metropolis, Daejeon, Park Song Hyo of the Senuri Party won 60 percent of the primary vote. The primary vote is merely an event within the party. The ruling Senuri Party must win in the upcoming local elections. We need your support. In Chungcheongnam-do province, ruling Senuri Party's Cheong jin Seok will compete against the current provincial governor, An Hee-jung, of the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy. Current Gangwon-do province governor, Choi moon soon of the main opposition alliance, will face off with the ruling party's Choi hyung jip The ruling party has finalized candidates for 14 of the 17 mayoral and provincial governor seats, while the main opposition has finalized 12 of its candidates. Candidates are chosen through a system that takes into account votes from party members, randomly chosen voters from the party, and the results of a phone survey. Kim young Arirang News. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is in the early stages of a European tour, but 
He has already managed to stir up tensions back here in Northeast Asia. Abe told the German Daily that his country would not follow Germany's post-war track in dealing with its historical wrongdoings. Our Connie Kim explains. Speaking to a German Daily Wednesday before his trip to Frankfurt, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said his country would not follow Germany's post-war track. Answering a question posed by Frankfurter Allgemeiner Zeitungs about whether Tokyo should benchmark Germany when dealing with its historical wrongs, Abe said the two situations are completely different. Since World War II, Germany has provided full compensation to neighboring countries and published textbooks that reveal the horrors that German leaders perpetrated. It's also apologized for its past wrongdoings. But Prime Minister Abe said that neighboring European unions had one common goal in mind, that being an integrated Europe. He said that is not the case for Asia. Abe added that Japan and its neighbors had already come to an agreement on compensation measures. The Prime Minister then turned his attention to the current tensions in Northeast Asia, blaming them on Japan's neighbors. He said the door to talks remains open, but that they should begin without preconditions. Abe's comments are once again raising eyebrows about Japan's sincerity to improve relations in the region. The Japanese leader criticized China for beefing up its military might, saying it would not serve to help Asia's economic development. He was responding to Chinese President Xi Jinping's remarks that criticized Abe's recent moves to the right. Prime Minister Abe left for a six-nation trip through Europe on Tuesday, where trade and security issues will dominate discussions. Connie Kim, Arirang News. U.S. researchers have been detecting increased activity at North Korea's nuclear test site, but say a nuclear test is not yet imminent if the regime follows its previous test practices. Satellite imagery posted on 38 North, which is a website run by the U.S. Korea Institute at Johns Hopkins University, shows vehicles and equipment outside a tunnel entrance at the Pungeri site. Now, in the past, all equipment, vehicles and personnel were withdrawn in the days before a test. However, the website does admit that it remains unclear whether North Korea will stick to the same procedures and timelines as it has in the past. Now, it said the buildup may be different if Pyongyang is really preparing for a new form of nuclear test as it has threatened. Meanwhile, Washington has designated four countries, namely Cuba, Iran, Syria and Sudan, as state sponsors of tourism but has once again left North Korea off that list. The U.S. State Department's annual report on terrorism, which has released on Wednesday, did not include North Korea for the seventh straight year. The last time North Korea was listed was back in 2008. Now, the report says... The terrorism sponsor state designation is given to a country that has repeatedly provided support for acts of international terrorism. It goes on to say that Pyongyang is not known to have sponsored any terrorist acts since the bombing of a Korean air flight in 1987. The U.S. has, however, recertified the North as a country, quote, not cooperating fully with Washington's counterterrorism efforts. Now, on to some health news. The World Health Organization says growing antibiotic resistance is a major global threat and is calling for urgent action. A new report from the UN body warns unless steps are taken to reverse the trend, minor infections we're able to overcome today could end up killing us in the future. Our Kim Yan Bin reports on this very disturbing health news. Global health authorities are sounding the alarm about the world's growing resistance to antibiotics, which they say could allow for a superbug to develop. A report by the UN's World Health Organization says the resistance is occurring right now and affects anyone, no matter their age or location in the world. The WHO's Assistant Director General for Health Security, Kiji Fukuda, said the world is entering into a post antibiotic era where minor infections and injuries that were easily treated for decades are killing again. The WHO report, which compiled data from 114 countries, said two key antibiotics in particular no longer work in more than half of people being treated in some countries. One of them, carbapenem, is used to treat people with life-threatening infections. 
The WHO is calling for urgent action to address the issue. Experts say drug resistance is driven by misuse and overuse of antibiotics, which has given bacteria a chance to build up immunity. To reverse the tide and stave off a global epidemic, experts say it will take political will and considerable investments in research and development. The WHO report also called for better hygiene, better access to clean water, and vaccinations to reduce the need for antibiotics. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Now, today is May Day or Labor Day here in Korea, of course, and we have the day off for most laborers, actually. But this coming weekend is a long weekend for most Koreans because it includes the day of Buddha's birth, which is a national public holiday here in Korea. Well, on that day, Korea hosts various cultural events to celebrate, and our immunity joins us today for a look at one event that has become very popular throughout the years. Good afternoon to you, Yunhee. Good afternoon, Kanyang. So I'm a little bit envious people have already began their long weekend, mm -hmm. but um, there is an event called the Lotus Lantern Festival, and it has something that's been celebrated here in Korea for many, many years. Now, this celebration is in, for the birth of Buddha, and it is celebrated all throughout the city, especially on the streets of Chongno. So let's take a look at this festival. Strung through the air, creating a colorful sky, these lanterns represent a century-old tradition in Korean history. Hundreds of years ago, Buddhism was prominent throughout Korea. In fact, it was once considered the most dominant religious and cultural influence in the country. Time has passed, but the impact of Buddhism can still be found around the country. And every year to celebrate the birth of Buddha, events are held. And the biggest can be found right under this colorful lantern ceiling. The Lotus Lantern Festival uh, originated in Silla era, more than 1,300 years ago. And the purpose of uh, the uh, Lotus Lantern Festival is to brighten our mind and as well as uh, the world. Called Yeondenghae in Korean, the annual Lotus Lantern Festival has come to become a symbolic cultural event for the people not only in Korea, but also from around the world. Although its roots are in Buddhism, the Lotus Lantern Festival attracts a wide range of guests. Mine will represent my family and that they're safe, and it's just learning a new culture here in Korea and learning something new. Since the Goryeo Dynasty, the annual Lotus Lantern Festival has been an opportunity for the community to gather as friends and family. But this year, the emotions were strong as the community drew together in remembrance of the victims of the Sewolho ferry accident. People offered their prayers and took time to reflect upon the lives lost as white lanterns marked the areas dedicated to those who fell to the tragic accident. And as the sun sets, one of the most popular parts of the festival begins. A troop of Buddhist monks lead the way with their lanterns lighting the path for the rest of the parade. Then large exotic floats are next in line, attracting crowds of people to the mesmerizing sights. Thousands of people have gathered here today to mark the very special occasion of Buddha's birth, a man who lit the way for many. You know, I think uh, this year's uh, Buddha's birthday celebration will be um, toned down a little bit, like you said, uh, remembering the victims and their families of this Hilho Ferry disaster. And I'm sure the uh, the Lantern Festival or the parade was toned down a bit from exactly. previous years, right? Exactly. So in the report, we kind of saw briefly there is a little section that they did um, label specifically for in remembrance of this Hilho victims. And so, you know, people are really taking time to remember the victims. But at the same time, it was it was kind of nice to 
see people on the streets and trying to get out there and you know kind of brighten the mood up a little bit. Right, right. So uh, what is the route for the lantern parade? All right, so the parade starts at Tongde Moon Gate and it goes through uh, Chongno Street and it ends at the Chogye Sa Temple. And so um, it is quite a long route. Many, many people are involved uh, with many parades and lanterns that you saw. And so it's very exciting. Um, a lot of kids were involved, especially in this event. Right, and I'm sure there are other events included in this parade, right? Exactly. So they had other uh, cultural performances, um, dances, and um, they also had a rope walk. And so they will continue to have performances. So uh, keep your eye out for that this weekend. We sh will sure do that. All right. Uh, thank you so much for that report today. My pleasure. And that's all for me at this hour. I'm Moon Gunyoung in Seoul. Check back with Arirang at 4 p.m. Korea time for Business Today.